OK, we're going to talk about the Rossetti poem, A Help Meet for Him. We're going to analyse language, form and structure, and we're also going to have relevant contexts. So one of the most important contexts for this poem um, is the patriarchal society and the attitudes that are found in this poem. The title of the poem, A Help Meet for Him, um, is a direct line from the King James Bible translation of the Old Testament. The creation story um, of how did God make everything on earth, um, and that includes humans. Um, and in one version of the creation story in the Old Testament, what happens is that God creates Adam first in his image, and then Eve. So you can see already that's making the man more important than the woman. Um, and the reason he gives for creating Eve is also um, extremely patriarchal. Uh, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And meet means fitting or suitable. So a help suitable for the man. That is why women were created according to this story. So you can see that that is a very male perspective and a male point of view. It relegates a woman's role to be secondary um, and to support men. That's why she's been made by God. Um, and that's an idea from, you know, 2000, 3000 years ago. But this is a very, very powerful idea. Um, we still live in very patriarchal societies in 19th century England. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a philosopher, who you would hope could think a bit better, um, argued that woman was made for man's delight. And Rossetti quotes that um, in the second line of the poem. Well, the first line of the poem. The title is a help meet for him. And then the second line, woman was made for man's delight. So a reminder that Christina Rossetti is well read. Um, and, you know, widely read French philosophy um, and also the patriarchal attitude she's up against as an intelligent woman who wants to be a writer and wants to be taken seriously um, as someone who can think and comment on issues. Possibly woman was made for man's delight is even less useful for women than saying they're a help meet for man. Yeah, because that literally just means they're just there for men to find attractive. OK, now the form of this poem is a named form. OK, so not all of Rossetti's poems have a named form, uh, but this one does. This is in the form of a roundel or a roundel. I don't know how you care to pronounce it. And unsurprisingly, fascinatingly, interestingly, it was a new poetic form devised by a poet called Algernon Swinburne. And he was part of the Pre-Raphaelite circle. He wasn't a painter. But he knew them and he corresponded with them and he met them and chatted and talked to them. And he was interested in their ideas about beauty, about medievalism, things like that. And the form of a roundel, like the form of this poem, is three stanzas. The first and the third conclude with a refrain, which may be a half line. And the rhyme scheme of a roundel goes A, B, A, R. That's the refrain. B A B A B A R. OK, so um, there's a little question for you to think about uh, the effects and the meanings that the roundel adds uh, to help me for him. If you want to pause, think about that question before I then tell you. OK, so three stanzas, the first and last have four lines and they have the alternate rhyme. Um, but the middle one is a tercet. The whole poem only uses two rhymes. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A. The line length is fairly regular, eight syllables with four stresses per line, but the last line of each quatrain is half, like we saw in the round out, it's only four syllables. So if you want to hear the meter a little bit, four stresses per line, woman was made for man's delight. Charm, O woman, be not afraid. Shadow by day, his moon by night, woman was made. Yes, yeah, only two beats in the last line, four in the others. Her strength with weakness is overlaid. Meek compliances veil her might. Him she stays by whom she is stayed. 
worldwide champion of truth and right. Hope in gloom and in danger, aid, tender and faithful, ruddy and white woman was made. Okay, so the opening phrase, woman was made, is repeated three times. It opens and closes the poem and it concludes the first stanza. Each stanza is also a sentence, so it's a very structured poem. But the second reverses this logic. Sorry, the first stanza stresses woman's subservient role, but the second reverses this logic and instead suggests female strength. The final stanza valorizes, that is, praises and makes good active and positive female roles in the world, not tied to having a husband. Okay? Not trying to delight a man or help a man, helping the whole world. So that's how the structure by repeating things actually enforces the argument that progresses. And that picture is of Florence Nightingale. Okay, so Florence Nightingale is a really good example of a woman in the 19th century who went out and did the kind of work that uh, this poem seems to be talking about. She went out to the Crimea and nursed, if you know about Florence Nightingale. Um, in the first stanza, there's a reference to woman being man's shadow. And this was a common trope, that is image, repeated image, in Renaissance poetry. There is a poem by the playwright and poet Ben Jonson, quite misogynistic, uh, arguing that women are but men's shadows. Women are nothing more than shadows of men. And what he suggests is that women should follow men, uh, not outshine them. So women are like shadows. At morn and even, that's evening, shades, i.e. shadows, are longest. At noon, they are short or none. Okay, so shadows are longest at morning and evening. In the middle of the day, they're short or there's no shadow at all. So when men are the weakest, so like in your day, in the morning and the evening of your life, when you're a child, when you're an old man, they are strongest, i.e. women. Like shadows are longest in the morning and the evening. Women are strongest at the morning and the evening of men's lives. But grant us perfect, i.e. at the noon of our life, they're not known. There's no shadows, there's no women. So I don't think you can get much more misogynistic than that. <laughs> yeah, basically, men don't need women. And if women are around, you're in trouble. Um, the idea of there being a problem, that women were a problem um, in the 19th century, this was actually sometimes phrased as the woman question. So in the Victorian understanding, women were the natural guardians of society's higher ethical standards. Okay, so this was a widespread stereotyped idea about women, that women were better, morally better than men. Um, and that's, you can see that when she, when Rossetti describes women as tender and faithful. Now, if that's the case, some people would argue that you could best preserve women's superior moral status by shielding them from public and political involvement. OK, so if you look at this illustration that's from a Victorian magazine, you can see that the men, the husband and the boy are associated with the outdoors and the active life. They're nearest the open door. They've got outdoor clothes on. Uh, they've got hats. They've got games. The dog's been out with them. The females are associated with the indoor life. They're in the house. They're in clothes that you can't do a lot in. Um, and that's their role. That's their place. But others, not just women, there were men as well who argued that women should have a more active role. They argued that British politics and public life would benefit if women are these morally superior creatures. Don't you need that view in political life and public life? So this was a live debate in Rossetti's time. It's sort of pre-feminism. Um, I mean, there were women arguing for women to have the vote and there were men arguing for women to have the vote, even at this point. Um, but just saying the world would be better if women had a more active role in it is a sort of beginnings of feminism. But, you know, don't call Rossetti a feminist. That would be too black and white. Uh, the imagery associated with women in the poem, as well as the shadow imagery, she then moves on to the idea of the moon being um, an image for women. His moon by night. So a woman might be a man's shadow in the day, but at night 
woman is a man's is the moon for the man and this is a more positive image okay one the moon is a symbol of sexual purity and chastity so the moon itself because it's white and cold <laughs> that's what people think chastity is and virginity is white and cold uh, that's what the moon stood for but other things the moon is a reliable guide to people lost at night in the dark so perhaps at night both literally and symbolically men are more at risk of moral failing while women stay pure and reliable acting as a guide to them so that's how his moon by night that's what a woman can do um, so this, this idea about gender and highly, highly different roles for men and women in Victorian society. Generally speaking, we're talking about the middle classes in particular. OK, uh, working class women always had to go out and work. So, you know, that already disputed one of these binaries. In order to maintain gender distinctions, women were praised and valued for fulfilling the roles society imposed on them. Spouse, mother, daughter. Uh, for example, there's a Victorian poet who wrote a popular poem praising the role of mothers called The Hand That Rocks the Cradle is the Hand That Rocks the World. The poem, acts, oh, sorry, so I'm just going to say a little bit about that poem. What it basically says to women is, yeah, you can't do anything. You don't have any power. You're not allowed to vote. You can't have jobs or professions, but you have the most important role in the world because you bring up the babies. Yeah, so you're the mother and you raise the child. And if you do that right, well, you've got such an important role. You run the whole world. It's a clever political technique for getting people to accept and not question their oppressed role in society. Praise them and go, oh, but it's brilliant. It's really hard to get rid of that praise because you've got to go, well, you know, being a mother's a bit rubbish. I don't want to do that. That's a really hard argument to make, isn't it? So Rossetti's poem does seem to accept certain gender binaries. For example, men are physically stronger, women are morally stronger. Yeah, she's, she's, she's all right with that. She plays with these binaries in a series of paradoxical statements using antonyms in the second stanza. Her strength with weakness is overlaid. Yeah, so that weakness is a physical bodily weakness. And we've talked about this, I think, biological determinism, the idea that women are weak because their bodies are weak. But she goes, uh -huh, their bodies may be weak, but they have this strength, this moral strength. Meek and might. Yeah, so she she's very meek and she goes along with what she's told to do, but she's actually mighty. Him she stays by whom she is stayed. So he controls her, but she controls him. Then you get to this you know, really dramatic final stanza where you get these active women being described. The final stanza's description of woman as worldwide champion of truth and right. Champion, that literally means someone who goes and fights for right. Yeah, like knights. They were people's champions. It seems to support those agitating for a more active role for women. So, for example, that image we saw of Florence Nightingale. Uh, Rossetti had an aunt who had volunteered with Florence Nightingale and had gone to the Crimea, which is um, sort of Russia, Turkey area um, where Britain was fighting and there were lots of injured soldiers. And Florence Nightingale had recruited volunteer women to go and help her nurse. And Rossetti herself had applied to do that. So we can bring in that context to help this interpretation of this poem uh, that it is saying women should and can do these active roles. Uh, I think champion of truth and right makes me think certainly of anti-slavery campaigns in Britain and America. Um, 700,000 women signed a petition addressed to the Queen of England, uh, Queen Victoria, in 1834 to abolish slavery. Uh, and women were involved in other campaigns in Victorian England against cruelty to animals, cruelty to children. Many of the charities that still exist to this day were founded in the 19th century by Victorian women on the whole. So the NSPCC, uh, the RSPCA, the RSPB, uh, that, that was their origins. Uh, and then this idea of women being an aid in danger is the most unusual way to think about women in Victorian England, being actively brave. Uh, so it's a much more active idea of female virtue. And a famous example in Rossetti's own time was Grace Darling. And this is a contemporary painting depicting the events that made Grace Darling famous. 
She was a lighthouse keeper's daughter. You can see the lighthouse just in the distance in the painting. And she and her father rescued the survivors of a shipwreck uh, in 1834. And she rode the rescue boat in, in these high stormy seas. So it's an amazing story. And she became a massive celebrity. There were Grace Darling um, embroideries. There were Grace Darling crockery. You know, she was, she was enormously famous. Um, some more of the poetic techniques, there are, there's lots of diction uh, that seems very feminine, like charm, shadow, moon, veil, tender. Yeah, the connotations of those are all soft and the sounds of them are quite soft. Um, in the final stanza, describing women as ruddy and white, it's the conventional idea of female beauty, all the way back to Renaissance, even medieval poetry. White skin, red lips, red cheeks, that's the ruddy and white. Um, line two addresses women directly with an imperative, charm, O oh woman. <laughs> um, and the tone in the final stanza is confident, even triumphant. And you have an emphatic caesura in the penultimate line, tender and faithful, ruddy and white. Yes, it sounds quite dramatic when you read it out.